Uh, I'm glad you're all here. You're not going to see me today. You're just going to hear from me. And we're going to go over some really cool stuff on uh, something that I learned years ago that made me a better boss, uh, a better salesperson, a better mother, a better significant other, a better sister um, across the board. And I think it's something that we all intrinsically know about. Uh, however, I'm going to really hold you guys by the hand as we go through this with the world of neurolinguistic programming. And so we'll dive into what is this neurolinguistic programming? How can it, how can it help us? Why is it valuable? Uh, and we'll get there in a little bit. It's me, Janine Driver. I'm so excited to be here with you guys. Happy 2019. And uh, let's get the party started here since we only have an hour together. Uh, neurolinguistic programming. Neuro is the brain, linguistic is language, and programming is the map of the world. That's how we put it all together. So I'm hearing some, um, some sound from people over there. Just put your mics on mute. There'll be a little microphone. You just click it. Uh, neurolinguistic programming. So neuro is that brain, linguistic is how we talk, and programming is how we put it all together. And we've heard of this before, right? We know that there are learners who learn best visually, some people prefer auditory. Some people prefer um, kinesthetic, doing stuff. So I think, Paul, your microphone is still on because you're popping up as the person who's talking. Uh, before we go into eye movements in particular, I want to take us back to something I've probably shared with you before, and I feel like it's worth revisiting, which is our body language shows up before thought. And this is critical to understand. Our body language shows up before thought. And we're going to see this in a TV series here, a little segment we have on a comedy show at night, one of our nighttime shows called Jimmy Kimmel. And he does this exercise called, this little bit called Mean Tweets, Mean Tweets. And he has celebrities come in and read, they don't know the tweet supposedly, what they're about to read. And I believe it in this case, they don't. They don't know what they're gonna read, but it's a mean tweet someone wrote about them on Twitter. So here we're gonna look at a couple people just to prove that our body language happens before our thought. So when we get into neurolinguistic programming with regard to eye movement, we'll know it's not that someone's consciously moving your eye, their eyes, uh, it's happening subconsciously. It's happening subconsciously. So let's look here. If Jennifer Aniston was using her brain and thinking, she wouldn't get upset about this, right? It's a mean tweet from some tool on online, right? On Twitter, right? Some troll. So, but yet we see sadness at the end of this tweet on Jennifer Aniston's face. I think a couple of seconds later, maybe five seconds after this, Jennifer Aniston probably catches up and realizes her brain begins to think, why do I even care? This tweet didn't even make sense to me. Let's dig in and watch how her body language is showing up. Jennifer Aniston is what happens when a bag of flour gets its big break. Because it's like I'm a bag of flour. <laughs> you may notice right here that the little bit of a dimpling in her chin, her corners of her mouth went down a second ago. And you also see stress in her eyebrows here. If the eyebrows pulled together and up, it would be extreme sadness. We're seeing tension, definitely sadness here in her face. Again, that she's like a bag of flour, got, a, got her big break. It's just, it's a ridiculous tweet. Um, and we see sadness here. Next is an actor by the name of Jim Parsons. And if you've seen me in person speak, you know that I talk about when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. And I have right now where you're listening in, just pull your lips in really tight, really tight. And imagine someone saying, I, what mom, I didn't do that. Imagine your client saying, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to move, move forward. Kronos is our top pick and their lips pull in. When we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. I'm telling you that because as you might imagine, we're going to see that here with this, this actor, Jim Parsons. Watch this. Jennifer. Hope that's Jennifer Aniston again. Jim Parsons looks like a ventriloquist dummy that came to life to become a sex offender. Oh. God. So there we see it. There we see it. Very funny clip. I'm sure if we all had our mics on, we're all laughing a bit um, to see this. So think about it. So here's this tweet. Jim Parsons looks like a ventriloquist dummy that came to life to become a sex offender. Uh, his lips disappear. This is like mortified. So when we don't like what we see or hear, our lips disappear. Again, a couple seconds later, he's probably like, boy, that was mean. And he can move on. 
Last but not least is a singer, country singer named Miranda Lambert. And here's why I'm showing Miranda Lambert last is because we're gonna look at her emotion. And I want you to notice with Miranda Lambert, I want you to notice her eye movements. In case of a national emergency, all air traffic will be redirected to Miranda Lambert's forehead. <laughs> all right, so we see sadness on her face for sure, right here around her mouth. I want you to pay attention to her eyes. When we talk with neurolinguistic programming, we're going to talk a lot about eye movement. We're going to talk about a little bit about body language and word choices as well. In particular, we're going to spend time in the eyes. This is going to blow your mind, guys. If you're not familiar with neurolinguistic programming, when you learn this, you're going to be forever changed. You're going to be forever changed. And the reason I say this is we look at people when we're talking to them, but we never really focus on eye movements. And when you realize that people move their eyes to grab the data. I say it's like they're opening a file cabinet and they open that file cabinet, reach in, grab that file. It's gonna be really fascinating for you. Uh, one of my sisters has uh, uh, four kids, but her oldest daughter, when she was young, would always um, leave the TV on really loud in the living room. And my sister called me and said, listen, I feel like my daughter might have a hearing issue. And I go, why? And she goes, well, when she listens to TV in the living room, she has it like so loud, it's ridiculous. I go, well, maybe she's just auditory. And had you been on that call, you would have heard my sister say, well, what do you mean by that? And I go, well, auditory people listen to sound and your kitchen is right next to your living room. So if you're doing dishes in the kitchen, you're cooking in the kitchen, you're making any other noises in the kitchen, um, that would be really difficult for your daughter to watch TV because she's picking up on all that other noise. I can't wait to get into auditory learners and how much they're retaining from just noise, how much they retain from noise. So uh, lo and behold, my sister moved a television or bought a new TV and put it in the basement area where they had a play zone and the TV didn't have to be at that massive high level because she would go down, her daughter would go down, watch television, and it was at a normal level because we didn't have all those other ambient noises um, catching her, uh, her ear. Uh, incidentally, uh, remind me if I forget, remind me to talk about uh, uh, how they give you eye contact, auditory people. Remind me to tell you how they give you eye contact. Body language happens before thought. Let's explore traditional world of body language. This is something connected to the seven universal emotions. We have these seven universal emotions. We're not going into deep today. I want to just remind you of them so you know they exist. As we begin to really focus in on the eyes, it's nice to relearn or revisit and touch base on these seven universal emotions, at least a couple of them here. We're going to watch this video. It went crazy viral over here in the States, perhaps over there across the pond as well. I want you to watch the emotion of the second dog. Not this dog. There's going to be a second dog in this video. And I want you to tell me what emotion do you see with this second dog? I'm playing this a couple times so you can see it. Perhaps you're doing what most people do when they see this video as you're laughing. So you, it's unexpected that this dog is a dog cake. The dog's cake gets, you know, the head of the dog gets cut off. And we can see this secondary dog leak, what? Fear. Now, with all due respect, you know, I come from the detecting deception world. Uh, we really don't know if this dog leaking fear was present when this happened, or these are two different videos spliced together. However, we certainly know that combined, whether they happened at the same time or they were two different clips, it creates an incredibly funny clip, incredibly funny clip. Here we're seeing what we call in my world, the detect and deception world, the three whites of the second dog. Let's see if I can pause it right here. We're looking at the three whites of his eyes. So we see off to the left of his eye, on the top and on the side. When we see the three whites of someone's eyes or even the four whites of someone's eyes, it's connected with a couple different emotions. Fear, panic, distress, and revulsion. Uh, I recently, since I saw you guys over there in the UK, I think I had already started losing weight. So I've lost a little over 100 pounds. I've been kind of uh, hanging out at the 100 pound mark. 
between 100 and 108. So I still have 50 more to go. I'm telling you about my weight loss because when I weighed 286 pounds, uh, oftentimes I would meet people who were these fat shamers. You know, I would sit down. I remember at a picture day with my son, I was one of the comb mothers. On picture day here, probably the same over there in the UK, uh, is we in England, uh, we have a comb mother. The mother comes in and combs your elementary school kids' hair before they take their picture. And uh, I arrived and a woman looked me up and down. And after she looked me up and down, I felt, wow, like this woman totally just fat shamed me. And uh, if you know what to look for, how do you know when someone just doesn't like you? Um, yes, there's disgust, which we can see in the lip or in the nose. And we can also see this in intense disgust with someone's eye movement. So this is pure revulsion or distress or panic or fear. So there's no reason for the other comb mother who was super fit, you know, so a tiny little thing, 110 pounds, what we say pounds over here, uh, tiny little thing, size four. And she looks at me up and down and then does this massive eye widening. Immediately, I know this woman is, you know, just mortified at how heavy I was. Um, as a matter of fact, they had two chairs there for the picture day. And I said, excuse me, I think she had a fancy purse. You could tell she had some money. You know, I'm a blue collar kid from Boston. I keep it real. You know this. And uh, she, I said, excuse me, I think after she looked me up and down, I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Janine. And she gave me this like mortified look. And I said, I think um, your pocketbook, her purse was on the second chair. I go, I think your purse is on my chair where I need to sit for the day for the next six hours. And she said to me, well, where do you want me to put my purse? And as you might imagine, I thought to myself, I have a really good idea where we could put that purse. Uh, she moved her purse, she held it in her lap and was just irritated. Um, and just this look right here sent a big message to me. As much as I tried to build rapport, it just didn't happen. Now, to speed up ahead, a couple of months later, I was at a big event for the school. And it was one of these galas where you pay a lot of money to go and they honor someone else that has a learning disability. This is a school my son goes to is, uh, for learning disabilities. Angus has dyslexia and verbal praxia and a couple things. And that woman came running up to me and said, uh, hey, excuse me, are you the woman on comb day with me on the picture day that was with the combs? I said, yes, I was. My name is Janine Driver. She said, by any chance, were you on the Today Show this past Friday? I looked at her and I go, yeah, yeah, I was. And then I walked away. And then I walked away and put my back to her. So if, if you're in a meeting and or you're meeting with a client and you're talking about uh, a, a hiccup they may have with a new product they're buying for you uh, and, from you, and you're like, hey, listen, for the next month, this might be a little bit of an issue. This is something we're working the kinks out of. This person doing this is letting you know they're in massive distress. Maybe they're the person that has to go tell their boss who wanted to go with your competitor. And so they're the ones that have to now go break the bad news to their supervisor. Understand when you notice this behavior, you can say something next, right? You can say, reassure them, reassure them, because they're letting you know there's distress here. We saw this with O.J. Simpson. O.J. Simpson said he never owned Bruno Magli shoes. Now, this is a big deal because there were Bruno Magli shoe footprints at the scene of the crime when Nicole was murdered her wife and, and Nicole's friend, Ron Goldman. Uh, watch O.J. in this first video. You're going to see um, very relaxed eyes. We don't see the three whites here in his eyes when he's lying to us. Body language wise, we certainly see some shoulder shrugs that indicate the, some deception. But look at his eyes here. We're going to focus on his eyes because we're going to play a second clip. We're going to have a change in his eye movement. If Bruno Magli makes shoes that look like the shoes they had in court that's involved in this case, I would have never worn those ugly ass shoes. You thought they, those were ugly ass shoes? Yes. Why were they ugly ass shoes? Because in my mind, they were. What about them was ugly, Mr. Simpson? The look of them, the style of them. What, what about the style? I don't know, they were ugly to me. Aesthetically, I felt that they were ugly, and I guess beauty is an eye to behold her. And to me, they were ugly shoes. All right, I'm going to give you a little sidebar here on detecting deception. I want you to understand, he's saying these ugly ass shoes. And uh, I want you to notice, uh, we're not having a lot of deceptive hot spots here. Yeah, because he could have owned them, and he could have thought they were ugly. Now, he never says, I didn't own them. He says what? I would have never owned them. 
pay attention to our language, of course, and that's a course. Maybe we'll do another uh, webinar down the line if you guys are interested on how to spot deception through language, through language. All right. Uh, the video here, we watch OJ's eyes, just like in the still picture. We don't see the three whites or even the four whites of the eyes. Now watch this next video. In this next video, OJ is shown a picture of him walking on a football field. And what do you think he's wearing in this picture? Yeah, Bruno Magli shoes. Watch the difference in his eye movements now. We're not only going to see the three whites, we're going to see the four whites of his eyes. You can even notice it if you look closely when he first looks at the picture. Now, OJ goes into fight, flight, and freeze response when shown this picture. This is why when he's asked to describe the coat he's wearing, which is a simply navy blue coat, sport coat, can you describe the coat you're wearing? He says, no, no, I can't. The reason he can't describe the coat is his brain is thinking, holy Toledo. All right, I've got the lie. I've got the truth. Uh, right in front of me, how am I going to get out of this trouble? He's having an internal conversation, and this is where it's going to get important as we dive into NLP and eye movement and how it connects to how we think. Watch the four whites and OJ's eye movements. Bruno Magli makes sure. Review looking at exhibit one, correct? It appears to me, yes. Okay. And the jacket you're wearing, could you describe it? No. Do you remember owning that jacket? No. Did you see that? Let's rewind it. Jacket? No. Are you seeing this? All right, watch it again. That jacket? No. Remember wearing that jacket? No. What about the shirt? Looks like a white shirt. Look at the close up of the shoes. Do you believe that those were shoes that you owned at that time? No. Those. Remember owning that jacket? No. Remember owning that jacket? No. Owning that jacket? No. Owning that jacket? No. Owning that jacket? No. All right, so we'll compare the two. Um, we see here uh, the big difference on the right of the screen if we compare it to that dog. When fear is here, the white eyes appear. So um, this is eye movement. Again, our body language can happen up to five seconds before thought. You know, if OJ thought about it, he wouldn't be leaking fear for sure. Same thing is going to happen as we dive in with our eye movements with neurolinguistic programming. This is what I call a blue streak, and you'll see this bolt of lightning occasionally. A blue streak is something that changes the direction of our life immediately, immediately. Like a bolt of lightning in the sky, you stop swimming, you stop playing golf, you get off the tennis court, your kids are outside, you scoot them in. Lightning is called a blue streak. A blue streak means something has changed forever. And I believe in our short webinar today, you're going to have a blue streak, if not many blue streaks. So I want you to, as we're learning today, at the end, I'm going to have you each share what's your blue streak. So grab a pen and a piece of paper. If you don't already have a pen and a piece of paper, there's a lot of data that's about to come your way over the next 30 minutes. So grab your pen, grab your piece of paper, start to think, okay, what's my blue streak? What's the thing? I'm like, wow, I really needed to... I really needed to hear that or wow, I mean, I can't wait to go talk to my clients or my vendors or my kids or my teammates or my boss. You know, there's traditional body language like these shoulder shrugs, right? So the shoulder shrugs, they happen without us thinking about it. Here's George Costanza. Uh, NLP eye movement, same exact thing. It happens without us thinking about it. I brought a funny little clip for you um, to show you with the shoulder shrug. Here's an athlete, uh, Mohamed Anas, who won this big soccer award and the world championship. He's going to say, uh, thank the sport, thank his fans, and thank his wife. When he thanks his wife, he's going to shoulder shrug. Now, a shoulder shrug means uncertainty, right? Shrug your shoulders. Say, I don't know. What do you want for lunch? I don't know. What do you want for breakfast? I don't know. That's a shoulder shrug. When we say something definite, I, I really like your hairstyle, and someone shrugs. It doesn't mean they don't like your hairstyle. It simply means there's something they're not telling you. Maybe they're not telling you they themselves need to get a hairstyle. So watch this guy. Why do you think Mohammed Anas is shoulder shrugging when he thanks his wife? Why do you think? Yeah. He might have a girlfriend, might be cheating on the wife. Oh, he's going to show us. Watch this. Thank you very much for, for, for this, for giving me this. And I appreciate my friends also, my wife and my girlfriend. Yeah, I mean, my wife, yeah, sorry to say, I'm so, I'm so sorry, my wife, thank you very much for, for, for this, for giving me this. And I appreciate my friends also, my wife and my girlfriend, yeah, I mean, my wife, yeah, sorry to say, I'm so, 
I'm so sorry, my wife. Thank you very much for, for, for this, for giving me this. And I appreciate my friends also. My wife and my girlfriend. I mean, my wife. Yeah, sorry to say. All right, why do I show you this as we're going into eye movements with NLP? <laughs> Pretty funny, right? I'm showing you this because if anyone has something to hold back and control the movement of his body, it's probably this guy, right? National television, actually worldwide television, worldwide championships, right? Worldwide TV. Here he is on TV. He's cheating on his wife. He has a girlfriend. If anyone has any more of a cause to hold back the truth from us, it's this guy. And yet his body language is revealing the truth. Same thing is going to happen with our eye much. movement their eye movements. These are other moves that we're not going to go into right now because I want to dive into NLP. So we're going to skip these eye movements and get into how eyes move. You know, studies have been done. If you take away the eyebrows uh, of famous celebrities, if you take away their eyebrows on their face and show that your whole, their whole entire face without eyebrows, uh, uh, many of us would not be able to spot who the uh, actor or actress is how valuable the eyes are. We look at the eyes more than we think. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at them with a different lens. Uh, I'm sure you can guess who this actor is. We're just looking at his eyes and we know this is who? Jack Nicholson. We know this is Jack Nicholson. This is how valuable the eyes and the eyebrows are. We really get pulled into people's eyes. We're gonna explore, all right, where do we go now with these eye movements? Where does this connect for us? The world of neural linguistic programming, NLP, there's tons of benefits to NLP. It can help you remove limited beliefs that you have about yourself, breaking those limited beliefs. It can help you access powerful internal resources uh, for others. When you're watching others, you can end up getting the results you want by watching someone else's eye movements. And this can lead to you having a life that you, you want and you deserve. Uh, and it can change how you're going to handle a conversation, how you're interacting with people. Right now, when you're pitching people, if you're on my sales team, it's really important you have three approaches. You have one for the visual, the auditory, and the kinesthetic. So this neuro-linguistic programming, brain, brain, our, our language, and how we put it all together. So let's explore this visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. First, let's look at our visual learners. Uh, approximately 60 to 65 percent of uh, learners are um, 60, approximately 60, let me say this differently, approximately 60 to 65 percent of the way uh, we learn, most people are at, in the visual category. So 60 to 65 percent of us prefer to learn, prefer to be pitched, prefer to learn about your new Kronos product visually, which means, you know, pictures and text to reinforce what we're learning, reinforce what we're learning. So this, um, this visual category, it, one of the best way to, to connect with people is in fact through, uh, you know, pictures and um, using your body language, using your body language. Next is, uh, I want to show this video about the visual learner about the visual learner. This is a fun video I found online. Ask yourself, do you think you're a visual learner? Here's a question. Do you sometimes have difficulty remembering people's names, but you're great at remembering their faces? Or maybe you're really good at moving odd-shaped furniture around corners, or packing your car full with so much stuff everyone told you it was going to be impossible. If so, you might just be a visual thinker. How about this? Try and remember an event from your past. What happens? Do you find yourself remembering something fuzzy like the significance or emotion mood around that event? Or do you remember specific scenes and images? For some people, it turns out that images and spatial relationships seem to dominate their thinking process. Basically, they think in pictures. It's thought that upwards of 60% of people are in this category. And it's a continuum, not all or none. Some people just think this way more than others. For example, for some people, and this might be you, a messy desk isn't a problem at all. You know where everything is, but you know where it is in relation to everything else. So when someone comes along and cleans that desk up, supposedly helping you organize, you completely feel lost and you can't find anything. The same sort of spatial thinking that helps you navigate a messy desk can be incredibly powerful. The chess grandmaster Bobby Fischer said that he could see all of the pieces on the chessboard even when it wasn't in front of him, which allowed him to practice and play in his head. 
Nikola Tesla, a pretty amazing inventor, took this one step further and said he was able to build and rebuild complicated machines in his mind and then run them to see where the moving parts could potentially fail. When he was only 24 years old, the inventor Thomas Edison described his experience this way. I have innumerable machines in my mind now, which I shall continue to illustrate and describe day by day when I have to spare time. But this kind of thinking, visual thinking, sometimes comes with a price. Namely, it can be hard to communicate what you're thinking to other people. Maybe you've had this experience where you see something pretty clearly in your head, but you wind up needing to draw it to explain it to someone else. Albert Einstein often said words failed him to describe the images in his head, but it turned out that those images were the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe. It was after he envisioned a man riding a wave of light that he was able to construct his theory of relativity. James Clerk Maxwell, the mathematical physicist, had a similar experience. His colleagues urged him to show the relationship between energy, entropy, and volume using equations, which is how they best communicated ideas. Instead, he used clay and plaster to show the relationship in the way that he understood it, as a physical and visual form of thermodynamics. And that's the power of visual metaphors. They allow people to see complex relationships in new, relatively simple ways. And the history of invention and discovery is filled with those kind of stories. For example, August Kekulé unlocked a new way of thinking about the structure of molecules when he envisioned a snake eating its own tail. In that moment, he realized that the bonds in the molecule benzene formed a ring. And this led to a whole new way of understanding how molecules could be visualized. And that's ultimately the challenge that visual thinkers face. How do you get those images out of your head and into the real world as inventions or discoveries? It's also why right now is such an exciting time for people who think like this. The digital age has brought technology that allows visual thinkers to directly experiment with the forms that they're best at understanding. Visual thinkers can now fold complex proteins on the screen or use 3D printers to build almost any form they can imagine. And they can invent and play in virtual reality spaces that just couldn't exist in the real world. It's a good time to be a visual thinker. So next time you forget the names of streets on a route that you can navigate with ease, don't beat yourself up. You might just be the next genius inventor of our time. What kind of inventor are you? Cool, right? So that's cool. So those are the visual learners. I think, you know, 65, 60 to 65% of us hang out there. Now, auditory, about 30% of us are auditory and process through sound, like my sister's daughter, who I told you about. <clears throat> These people, they cannot focus when it's noisy. As a matter of fact, I told you to remind me, I remembered. Um, the way they give you eye contact, auditory people, is they'll lend you an ear, <clears throat> excuse me, which means they won't give you eye contact or they'll give you less eye contact. They'll literally put their ear towards you and their eyes look away. Now, as a parent, we teach what? We say to our kids, look at me, young lady, when I'm talking to you. Look at me. If you do that to your auditory learning child, they actually will retain less information by looking at you. Let them lend you an ear. Uh, Al Gore, from, former vice president of the United States of America, uh, one of my fellow body language experts, you guys know him, I think, Chris Ulrich. Um, Chris Ulrich is a body language expert. He used to work for Al Gore. And Chris told me when he learned about NLP from me, he told me, Janine, this would have saved my career. Al Gore would very rarely look at Chris. And Chris's job was to tell Al Gore, you know, late breaking news from around the world before he hit the stage. Chris was one of the people when Monica Lewinsky's story broke that had to speak to uh, Al Gore. Hey, I just want to let you know this story broke. In the news that morning, Al Gore is getting on stage to give this big, huge talk in the, mid, in, in, uh, in, the, um, in the middle of our country, in the middle of our country. I was going to say the Middle East. That's so funny. No. Uh, here in the middle of our country in the United States. Well, guess what happens? Chris is in a panic because he doesn't think Al Gore is really listening to him because he's not looking at him. Al Gore goes out on that stage and kills it, gives one of his best talks ever, one of his best talks ever. Chris said, Janine, if I knew all of my bosses that didn't give me eye contact, it wasn't because they didn't like me, didn't respect me. It was simply because perhaps they were auditory. It would have changed the game for me. Where do you have supervisors, vendors, clients, your kids um, that not, are not giving you eye contact? And you walk out of that meeting really feeling de you know, deflated. You, know, you felt like you didn't really catch them. Uh, they, didn't, you know, they weren't really listening to you. They were distracted. 
maybe they weren't distracted at all. Maybe they're simply auditory. Maybe they're simply auditory. Now, here's the deal, guys. Uh, about 30% of us are auditory. I certainly am not. Auditory learners remember about 75% of what they hear. About 75% of what they hear. So keep in mind and remember, they remember almost every last detail of your conversation. That's when it's good and when it's bad. So if you're getting in a fight, oh, they're going to remember exactly what you said 10 years ago. 75% of what they hear, they're remembering. The best way to communicate with these auditory people on your team and in your life are through, uh, you know, through sound, through conversations, right? So these are the people who um, are going to listen to that dialogue versus the visuals who are what through pictures and images and diagrams and maps and bright colors, right? So here, understand they process through sound. They process through sound. Now we have visual, auditory, and the last category is kinesthetic. Kinesthetic are um, the emotional-based people. These are the people that process through doing, and about 5 to 10% of us are kinesthetic. Imagine teaching these bartenders you know, how to make drinks by giving them a handout, you know, step-by-step -step handout, or even a handout with pictures. The kinesthetics are going to want to actually get involved. They're going to want to do it. So uh, best way to communicate with these kinesthetic learners is to get them moving, give them some type of a challenge to solve, you know, through something like a role play or interacting with others. They need to do something. Uh, in order for the kinesthetics to understand something, they need to literally get up and get involved. And that helps them make a connection to what you're trying to teach them and what you want them to comprehend. It's the actual act of moving. You know, we're not going to go overly deep here with eye movements. This in and of itself, NLP, is a four-hour block. So this is a three-part program we do online. Uh, and if, if you want more, we can go deeper. Uh, and not only can we go deeper, if there's videos you'd want me to look at with you, we could actually pull some videos. You guys could each come to the table with a video for us to analyze together. Um, I want to, the reason I'm giving you this little, um, this, this precursor to what we're about to do is, I, I'm gonna show you what these letters mean, and we're not gonna go super far on, um, on some of them. So first I want you to look at this, um, the VAF, we also call this VAK, so visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. We're, I'm looking at the left of my screen, I don't know if you guys can see my arrow as I'm pointing here. So over here in the top left corner under the word construct, is the V in the, in the color black. So this is visual, this is visual people look up. So if you look to the right of the screen above the word remembered and under the word at the top called remembering, you see a black letter, another V. That's because people who are visual, when they go to get the data, they're looking up, their eye movements go up. And we're gonna explore this with looking at some celebrities in a second. Auditory tend to go either to their ears. So as we move down, you'll see an A and an A uh, in black, um, A above the word construct and an A above the word over here and remembered. Um, this is auditory. Auditory people tend to move their eyes to the ears. We, I have Maya Angelou here. If we have time to watch her, I'm sure we're gonna see a lot of eye movement to the ears since she was a poet. I want you to notice though, this is tricky because look down here is another A at the bottom right um, because A is internal dialogue. So if we saw this actor who used to play this great show over here called House and, and uh, I think he played Sherlock Holmes for a little bit or something, some type of an investigator. Um, right here, uh, his name's you, right? So we see down here another A because this is internal dialogue. This is when people talk to themselves. So if someone is looking down left, and when we talk about NLP, we're talking from their perspective. So here I would say down left, <clears throat> even though this is down to our right, but NLP is spoken about in the perspective of the person we're looking at and analyzing. So this would be what we call down left. His eyes went down left. This is having a conversation inside his head. Now, lefties can be different, can be. And some of our righties can be different. But for the most part, most right-handed people look down left. Over about 90% of us look down left. Some could be opposite. Now, over here, down right is feelings. So down right. I want you to, we have an, an American expression. I don't know if it translates over there uh, well. But we say, I was downright livid. I was downright angry. 
Um, so I want you to think downright is emotions, right? So downright angry, downright upset. So downright are emotions. This is where people are accessing their feelings. This is the kinesthetic sensation, touch. If someone goes, looks downright, you could say, are you feeling okay? Are you feeling okay? Uh, if I were you, I would take a screenshot of this. Actually, let me back it up. If I were you, I'd take a screenshot of this as well. So figure out how to do your screenshot for me. It's um, Command, Shift, and 4. I'm on a Mac, so I do Command, Shift, and 4. Uh, I'll give you a second. If I were you, I would highlight this, um, take a little screenshot so you could check it out. We're going to be exploring the movements now. All right, here we go. Um, take a screenshot of this one as well. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. I am videotaping this, hopefully. Hopefully this is videotaping. And I'll send this over to all of you guys and anyone who is unable to be here today. Um, so with visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, there's not only eye movement, there's language. So someone who's very visual will use these words off to the left. Someone very auditory will use the words in the middle. And someone off to the right is very kinesthetic. This program is very lecture today because we don't have a lot of time. If we were together doing this live, we would be doing a lot of interaction exercises. So my visual and auditory listeners are really going to follow along nicely here today. My kinesthetics, um, you're really excited that I told you to take a, a screenshot. You're like, great, I get to be involved. I'm doing a screenshot. I'm interacting. Uh, thanks, kinesthetics, for hanging in there. I'm kinesthetic myself. Uh, so it might be nice to have something in your hand you can kind of play with, like a pen, something you can, um, you know, one of those squishy balls. You're probably moving in your seat as we continue to go through this presentation. These words, I want you to take a screenshot. We write them, pick what I say your top three words. And understand every time you guys are doing sales, you have to use at least three words from each of these columns. You have to, because the people you are meeting, you don't know if they're visual, auditory, kinesthetic. And you're going to use words that connect to your world. The way you process information, we call this your modality. So my modality is I'm very visual and I'm very kinesthetic. They're about 50-50 for me. As a matter of fact, while I'm doing this webinar, I'm in a giant, uh, huge, three times my size of my body, uh, um, bean bag that's orange. So it's orange because I like these bright colors. That's my visual and it's kinesthetic. I'm literally doing this webinar on a bean bag. All right. So um, that's my kinesthetic and visual side. If you come in and you're very auditory, you're going to say something because you say you process through auditory. You're going to say, Janine, listen to this. Does that resonate with you? How does that sound, Janine? Hear me out, Janine. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you about this, Janine. Can I give you a call? All right. You're like, let me give you a call on this. So just understanding if you're talking to me in that world, my brain hears that and has to change it. Like the difference from English to French. I say, hello. You're French, you say, you hear me say hello, and you go, oh, she means bonjour, uh, or salut, right? So um, here, tell, sound, resonating, listen, silence, depth, squeak, silent, roar, melody, call, harmony, there's a million more. Understand you're using this language. When you talk to me with these words, my brain has to shift, okay, what they meant was, hear, uh, instead of hear this, do you hear me? Are you listening? Can you picture this? Do you see what I'm saying, Janine? When you say that, do you see what I'm saying? My brain understands you right away. And as you all know, rapport, rapport. I say this weird because I'm from Boston and our R words are weird, uh, which is another R word, the word weird. Weird, we say weird, wicked weird. Rapport, R-A-P-P-O-R-T, rapport, is when people like people who are like themselves. When you speak in the language that I understand through these words, my brain doesn't have to do that little translation and we get to build rapport quickly. I'm like, oh, she's my people. She's my people. She gets me. So uh, right here, do you see what I'm saying? It's definitely something I use. I have to work on using auditory words when building rapport. So just find, you know, I say get three uh, and make sure, I don't care in the beginning, you can write those three on a file, uh, you know, on a piece of paper you have, type it on the top of the paper. Um, so you know to use them. Same thing with your kinesthetics. You're going to have kinesthetics in the room. So make sure you not only are getting them interacted, interacting, you want to make sure you're using some of these words. How, how does this feel for you? Are you grasping what I'm saying here? Uh, all right. So um, it seems like you're catching on. It seems to me like you're catching on here. 
um, you're now going to address all of your audience. This in and of itself, a study was done with a credit card company years ago, and just over the phone, you can use NLP, over the phone. The customer service function of this credit card company became one of the leading revenue generating functions of the company. Uh, they went, think about it, customer service is where we call to complain, right? 360% increase in sales after people talk to customer service. And what the customer service people were taught were just this, listen to the words other people are using on the phone. And once you can start hearing certain words they're using, you can use those particular words in that modality. Uh, and at the very least, make sure you're using all three categories so people understand, right? So in order for someone very kinesthetic in this kinesthetic category, they need to grasp it, right? So the best way is to get them thinking of it, getting thinking by using these power words. So hopefully you've taken a screenshot here. Now let's dive in with our eye movements. Uh, and um, I started three, I think four minutes late to get the computer up and running. So I'm gonna run to 10.04. If some of you have to step out at 10, before 10.04, I totally understand. We won't be able to go over all these videos because they're very, very long, but let's look at Maya Angelou who, uh, is the great poet. She's, you know, passed away. Uh, watch her eye movement. They go to her ears quite a bit. I put the little icon on the bottom right for you. And some of you are probably wondering, okay, so there's visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Remember, visual people look up. Auditory people look to their sides or down left. And kinesthetic is over here to down right. You're probably wondering what these other letters are, the C's and the R. And that's what I'm talking about. That's a different level. Um, one is remembering and one is construct. So one is remembering, which is uh, remembering something and one is construct. Uh, in the old days, we used to teach NLP for detecting deception. Uh, you cannot use detecting deception for NLP because it's been sci scientifically proven and you can't do it. If I asked you to describe your mother's um, face for me, you may go to a spot that's visual construct, upper right, which is in the old days, we'd say you're lying about a past event if you looked up or right. That's not true because maybe your brain is just imagining your mother's head floating in air because I said, imagine, describe your mother's face for me. And you're just imagining your mother's face floating in air. So there your brain would go to creating an answer. So this construct, this create. Uh, so you, you don't know how someone's processing your question. However, visual recall and remembered versus construct and create um, is incredibly valuable when you are talking to people and they're holding something back and we see a change in their baseline. So uh, that's a topic for another time. So we're just focusing on the VAK right here, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Okay, we see on the, the left and right, visual look up, auditory look to the ears or down left, kinesthetic. Let's dig in. Every day, challenges, truly. Some things... Down left. Some of the challenges. All right, do you see it? So we're already having an internal dialogue. Boom, first couple of seconds with Maya Angelou. She's going into internal dialogue. She lives here. Um, she looks down left quite a bit into her ears quite a bit. Um, let's continue to watch. So someone like Maya Angelou, you want to make sure you're using more than three of those words. Not just when you're in your pitch meetings and on the, uh, and on the phone, right? What about with your marketing materials? If I were you, I would make sure I have three different presentations. I'd have a presentation that is, is using language and is writing things in a very visual way, auditory and kinesthetic way. Uh, and that way, I'm telling you, it'll change your numbers big time if you create three different presentations and maybe even four where the fourth one is you're combining a little bit of everything. And, and at, if you're wondering where to start, I would start with the one that has it all that has all of the modalities addressed, how you would talk about it with your language and the videos and the visuals and the auditory. Let's watch Maya Angelou again a little longer. These were more public than others. Some so private I couldn't even mention them in public. Some having to do with- Did you see her go to her ears? Some having to do with prosperity. Some She'll do it again. Some having to do with romantic love. Some having to do with my family. The same issues which face and beleaguered uh, every human being in the world have and still there it is. Do, do you see it? Have beleaguered me and still do. So, uh, every human being in the world have and right there. So we see Maya Angelou. Uh, I'm looking off to her right. We see this a lot with her. 
she's very, very auditory, right? Very great poet. Um, this would be something you'd see with Al Gore. She's looking at the interviewer during this conversation, and we're seeing these eye movements go. I'll let her play a little longer. Have beleaguered me and still do. So that down left again. The challenge for me to meet you this morning to get up def defying gravity and stand erect and to remain erect and to be absolutely present with you so that everything I know I have here in this chair with me now, I don't know what you're going to ask me. So I'm challenged to be as honest as possible, as courageous as possible, and as kind as possible. That's what I'm challenged. I was challenged as a young girl at seven years old. I was raped and, and I, I told the name of the rapist. I don't want to go there, but we see her eye movements go down. Now let's bounce over to Adele. Let's check out Adele's eye movements. What I want you to do is if I were you, I would take your piece of paper, draw a circle and draw a picture of the eyes like we see in our diagram in the bottom right here. Just draw a circle face, like a happy face. Do two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. And what I would recommend is just doing tick marks when you see Adele's eyes move in different directions. Just do a tick mark, top right, bottom left, bottom right. Just do some tick marks. Let's see how you guys do. Uh, you've been called the most promising talent of 2008. How do you like the uh, extra attention? Um, I don't mind. It's all right. It's nice to be um, tipped and to... to um to have lots of people thinking I'll do that. It's quite, it can be a bit hard though sometimes. Um, a lot to live up to, but I'm not that awesome. So think about this. She's a hot ticket. I love Adele. She's one of the people I definitely want to see in concert. I want to be her friend, right? I just love Adele. Look at her eye movements going all over the place. Now, it's not where the eyes are just rolling all over the place. We're looking for where Adele opens a file cabinet, reaches in and grabs that file. You can see it's like a little bit of a hang time. We certainly see her now on the bottom left. She's hanging out there. Not surprisingly, she's a singer, right? So we go back into that internal dialogue here and having this conversation. Earlier, a second ago, we also saw her go very visual. We saw Adele going up when, when she was chatting. So let's go back here. Here we go. Look at this. So if we were to talk here, visual construct, she's thinking about an answer she may not have thought about before. And so her eyes are going up right here. So it says visually thinking about something. Let's see what she was talking about when she looked here. To be tipped and to, to, um, to have lots of be, um, to be tipped and to, to, um, to have lots of people thinking I'll do that. It's quite, it can be a bit. Uh, extra attention. Um, I don't mind. It's all right. It's nice to be, um, be tipped and to, to, um, to have lots of people thinking I'll do that. It's quite, it can be a bit hard though sometimes, um, a lot to live up to, but I'm not that fast by. I think there's quite a lot of promising acts for 2008. I think um, Vampire Weekend, Buffy and Laura Marling as well. Um, so I'd like to be part of them rather than the one. <laughs> the one, yeah, yes. you don't want to be the one. Not really, no. <laughs> yeah, too bad, Adele, you are the one, my dear. All right, so we see her going where? upper left. So we see her visualizing something here. We saw her a second ago visualizing something. Let's back that up a smidge. Just before she says not really, no. One. <laughs> the upper right. She doesn't really want to be the one. She's constructing. She's imagining what that would be like if she was the one. Yeah, yeah. Don't want to be the one. Not really. So not really. So here's where the eyes go up. She's imagining, listen, I've been the star of a show before and I know what it's like. Uh, body language wise, by the way, we're seeing disgust here. So we know this is legit. This is legit. And we already know this about Adele anyway. So look, we see some contempt. It's a fascinating video. So let's move uh, on from Adele. Hi, Adele. Let's see. What do we have coming up? Jim Carrey. Let's check out Jim Carrey. So I, br I put him into the mix because He's super visual. Let's see if we take this guy and he's very kinesthetic, right? He's into these emotions. This is a young Jim Carrey in 1983. We're gonna look for, where are his eyes hanging out? Does he go very visual at the top? Is he going to his down right? Very kinesthetic. Ready? Let's dive in. Um, or something is so different from being on- Boom, look at that. He's right out of the gate going where? Down right. So right here, remember, down right angry. This is that kinesthetic right out of the gate in the beginning of this interview. Am I surprised? Absolutely not. 
his whole routine is very embodied. Um, he's talking here about what it's like, the difference between acting and being on a stage. So being on a stage, it's engaging, and his brain is just literally imagining how he is jumping all around on the stage and how he interacts. Let me rewind it so you can hear again what he's talking about. And then I'm gonna let this run for uh, about 15 seconds. It's so different from being on stage. It's, uh, it's two different worlds. Back then, Jim was known solely for his countless impressions in his stand-up comedy routine. I had no idea really what I was doing until about maybe a year ago when, when, uh, when uh, people started telling me. You see when, it? When, uh, when uh, people... It's constant, constant down. So Jim Carrey, so the thing about these kinesthetics in our life, these are the people that are moving their foot 100 miles an hour. And if you're lecturing or you're in a meeting and it's running long, you see them getting very fidgety. It's not out of disrespect for you. It's that literally they need to engage and move. So for kinesthetics, you want to make sure you have lots of breaks. You have lots of different interaction uh, and movement with your kinesthetics because they're going to get really fidgety fast. These are the doers. These are the people that are going to be the doers. Started telling me that that's what was... As he's picking his ear. ...about me that, that, uh, that my face is real weird. Calling you, oh, the next Marcel Marceau, the next Robin Williams. Does that kind of work? Fantastic. Okay, I want to go way back now. <laughs> There's no, no feeling like being up in front of an audience when you, when you go crazy and you really put something out and they just go, everybody goes, oh, you know, off the edge of their seat and they cheer for you and things like that. There's no feeling like that. It's, a, it's so different, it, it, it can't even be compared. It's just that all my life, all my life I've really wanted to do this. So it doesn't seem like I've been in the business for a short time. It's all I've ever wanted to do. It's all I've ever done. All right, cool. That's a great, that's a great example. Now let's go into Jennifer Lawrence. Let's go into Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> The only reason why there's so much focus on the entertainment industry is because these people are famous. That doesn't mean that there's less sexual abuse in the entertainment industry. All right, so let's go here. So we see Jen, An um, Jen Anson. Uh, we see Jennifer Lawrence, um, internal dialogue here. She's having a little conversation and then she's telling us what she's thinking about. Hey, the only reason with this hashtag me too, everyone's talking about celebrities and she's telling us, watch her eye movements here. Because these people are famous. That does mean that there's less sexual abuse going on anywhere else in the world in any other uh, place of work but fortunately we're start very auditory at this point in the conversation now but do you think the culture of the leverage of power and culture of abuse will change i hope eventually i, I think it's going to be a while. i think it's so deeply ingrained unfortunately socially and kind of this social proof of some way of your masculinity and until we're equal in every way how can you expect us to be respected verbally if we're not being respected by the way super super visual right look down left down left on left i'm not visual auditory sorry that was a mistake super super auditory down left down left over here in this bottom category she's having all this in dialogue uh, and she's just a wordsmith. She's a wordsmith. You know, her humor, she's incredibly funny. Her humor comes from her memory of different words. Um, her best friend or BFF, Amy Schumer, same thing. They can be very, very auditory and, and recall words and phrases. This is typical of someone that's very auditory. I think we have more with just Jen, um, Jen Lawrence with just auditory, though. I think she, we're going to see something else in a second. Stand by. Every other way. But also sometimes I've had this happen. I've, I've, I finally made the decision to stand up for myself because I, the director said something fucked up to me and I said, that's sick. You can't talk to me like that. And then I was punished and I got afraid that I, I was afraid I was going to be hired again. Yeah, and got the, got the, yeah, it was called difficult yeah. and a nightmare. So I think a lot of people aren't coming forward because they're afraid they're not going to work again. All right. Did you see briefly? And got the, got the, yeah, it's called difficult yeah. nightmare. So. She went down there. See, this is kinesthetic. She's talking about something yeah. kinesthetic. Someone yeah. said something inappropriate. Yeah, and the, 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 yeah, it was called the yeah. nightmare. So do you see it really fast? Nightmare. When she said the word nightmare, her eyes go down to that emotional spot. Yeah, and got the, got the, yeah, it was called the, yeah. the nightmare. So right there. See her? So here we see her eyes go down right. This is very kinesthetic in that moment. And a lot of people aren't coming forward because they're afraid they're not going to work again. 
Exactly. That's what needs to change. All right, here's another one of Jennifer Lawrence. They do this fun show on, on YouTube where they hook a, uh, actors up to a uh, polygraph. And then we're going to wrap up. I'll skip along. What are you looking at? Nothing. What are you looking at? I'm looking for the truth. And you too. If somebody showed up at the same party with the same outfit, would you Am change? I? No. Do you look better with a suntan? Yes. Do you ever fake tan? Yes. You wanted to look. I did. I'm looking much. Why'd you want to look? Because I used it on my body, but not my face. The truth is revealed. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any styles you think you could never pull off? Yes. Do you regret any of your red carpet looks? I do, but I don't regret that one. Oh, sorry. Were you going to ask that? Maybe. Of course I regret red, red style. Red. Of course I regret red carpet looks. Photograph, please. Thanks, guys. My hair was fabulous that night. Is there a trend you tried you felt you couldn't pull off? Yes. Super That's auditory, better. guys. Are you seeing that with eye movements? All right, I'm going to skip along. I, oh, I want to show you the, uh, this video because I'm thinking we're going to get some visual happening here. Watch this. This will be our last one. This is Julie Sweet. She's the CEO of Accenture. You need to be fearless. You need to be. All right, she's going to tell a story about her dad. So this will be our last one, and then we'll wrap up. Here we go. I won't charge you extra for the couple extra minutes I'm giving you guys. <laughs> Oh. And I say, you, you need to be fearless, but prepared. Right? And a lot of times people will say, you should take risks, but you don't take risks just for risk's sake. Right? And in a world where, in fact, you've got to make decisions about all the information, almost by definition, we're taking risks. And so it's really the underlying preparation. Have you sought out the right people? Are you collaborative? Are you fact-based? And at the same time, do you do all of those things with speed? So fearless but prepared is really how I try to lead. I don't know if you saw upper right right there. Is really how I try to lead. So we just how I try to lead. So her eyes went upper right. I try to lead. Just a second before that. Let's see. So fearless but prepared is really how I try. To lead. We just saw it right there. Did you see it? Upper right. Really how I really have. right there. So she looks upper right. Who else do I have in here? Oprah. It was time for me to go. And that I started the process for myself of preparing myself for you will not be here long. You are not gonna be able to get what you need. I had a boss at the time. Visual. Uh, right here. Thank you, Oprah. I and, I, I, and I don't think that's fair because we're doing the same job. We sit in the same show. We did say, And my general manager said, why, why should you make as much money as he? And I said, because we're doing the same job. And he said, um, but he has children. Do you have children? And I said, no. He said, well, he has to pay for college education. He, has, he owns his own home. Do you own your home? I said, no. He said, he has uh, a mortgage to pay. He has insurance. He has a, do you have that? No. So to tell me, why, you, why do you need the same amount of money? And I said, thank you for your time. And I left. I left. I didn't complain about it. I didn't file a, a, a suit about it. I knew that in that moment, it was time for me to go. And that I started the process for myself, of preparing myself for, you will not be here long. You are not going to be able to watch get this visual. I had a boss at the right there. So bam. Thank you, Oprah. I wanted to end with giving you a visual. So now we have the visual auditory kinesthetic. So she's talking about, I had a boss and she's picturing the boss. Oprah is super visual. She's very, very visual. You can even see in the cover of magazine, she wears bright colors. So right here we see Oprah going upper left. That's our visual and Oprah winds it all down for us here. Uh, and uh, to make sure we're all on the same page, we've got a quick exercise as I say my goodbyes to see 
are we all on the same page? All right, so did you find the power of reading neurolinguistic programming, understanding that body language happens before thought and how you can use it to boost sales, to boost rapport, to get results that you want, to access powerful internal resources, not only for yourself by understanding, oh, wow, I'm very visual, I'm very kinesthetic, uh, I'm very you know, auditory. It can help you in so many ways. It can help change, adapt um, your presentation when you're talking with others, and for sure, build that rapport and trust a lot faster when you're talking someone's language. So here's our test. Um, you're gonna touch your screen here. Let's see how we do. This guy, Richard Weissman, I love him. He's on the internet all over the place. I've, I've written to him before, um, has put us to a test. Let's see if we are all on the same place today as we start our Monday and where we start our work week. Uh, did we all connect together even though we're not interacting together? Let's see, here we go. Get ready to touch the screen. Hi, I'm Richard and this is The Prediction. What I'd like you to do is lean forward and place your finger on the start square here. Now during the test, you can move from side to side. You can move up and down. You can visit a square that you've visited before, but you mustn't move diagonally. Okay, make one move now. So at the moment you have your finger either on this square here or this square here. Keep it exactly where it is. Now every time I say a number, make a move. Remember, up or down, side to side, but not diagonally. One move at a here time. One move at a time. Guys. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. And I predict that you won't have chosen the house over here. And here we go again. One, two, three. And now I predict you won't have chosen the V. Here we go again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this time, I predict you won't be on this symbol. Here we go again. One, two, three, four, five. And now your finger is not on the arrows. Here we go again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you haven't chosen the unhappy face over here. Here we go again. One, two, three. And you are not on the wavy lines. Make one last move now. And I predict you didn't choose the cue, but instead your finger is on the happy face. And that is the prediction. And I'm ending with that happy face. All right, I think we're done, guys. This is it, enjoy your day. It was wonderful chatting with you. I'm sorry you don't see my, my little, uh, my face over here. I don't have my makeup on yet either. I love neuro-linguistic programming. I use it all the time. Uh, my son, Angus, my oldest, who's 13, is very, very kinesthetic, very kinesthetic. As a matter of fact, I think his favorite thing to do is shh, shh. He puts his finger in front of his lips and tells us all the shh constantly. It's that kinesthetic in him. Um, his second one is sound. So he's really related to sound. Um, there are numerous tests you guys can take online. So hit Google if you want to um, take this test and you answer different questions. There's different ones uh, on what are you? Are you visual, auditory, kinesthetic? I'm 50-50 kinesthetic and visual. And you can, you can find that out uh, online. There's freebies or there's booklets that you can buy. And this is Janine Driver. I love you guys over there.